Chapter 5 deals with inventory. Last class, we ignored the inventory side of the transactions, simply looking at the sales side. What we did last class would be all we needed to know if we were in a service industry, since doctors and lawyers don't typically have inventory for resale. Part of what we will do in this class will be to add in that second half so we can keep track of inventory costs, not just sales. We can break the life of inventory into three separate chunks. When we purchase it, what we do while we're holding it, and then when we sell it. For the purposes of this class, we'll take the cost of inventory as exogenous and simply see how it affects our financial statements at each stage. When we get into the last couple chapters of the book, we'll start looking at how we determine inventory cost, particularly when we are a manufacturing firm and are doing more than just writing a check to our supplier. That can get pretty hairy though, so we defer it until we have a bit more knowledge under our belts. So our first question is what inventory should we be reporting on our books? That is, how do we know if this is our inventory or not? There is a general rule, and there will be a number of general rules as we go through this, with clarifications or exceptions when needed. Our general rule for determining what inventory is ours is that inventory becomes ours when custody is obtained. When we take physical possession, it's safe to say that the inventory is ours, and when we give it to the customer, then it becomes theirs. However, we live in a globalized economy, and often inventory will travel halfway around the world to us, and while it's in transit, it's not in our warehouse or in their warehouse, so whose inventory is it? This brings us to our first exception, related to goods in transit. Here we are on December 31st, because that's when this really matters, our reporting date, and someone just shipped us a volleyball and some ice skates with Tom Hanks, in case you didn't get the reference without him. And what happens? The FedEx plane goes down, and then he goes all and starts talking to the volleyball and whatnot. What do we do? Whose volleyball and ice skates and crazy guy are they? Well, it depends on the shipping terms, and so we introduce the term free on board, or FOB. And we've got two choices, FOB shipping and FOB destination. And these particular contract terms dictate exactly when the transfer of inventory takes place. If the term inventory is shipped FOB shipping, then as soon as the seller drops the inventory off with the common carrier, either the post office or FedEx or donkey train, the inventory belongs to the buyer. Even though it isn't in their physical possession, it belongs to the buyer. Conversely, is if inventory is shipped FOB destination, then it re remains the property of the seller until it arrives at the buyer's place of business. So our December 31st inventory might or might not include inventory that was in transit on December 31st, depending on what the shipping terms were. This is an important distinction from more than just an accounting standpoint. FOB also dictates who bears risk of loss. So when that volleyball went down with Mr. Hanks, did the volleyball belong to the shipper, in which case they have to send a replacement, or did it belong to the buyer, in which case they're SOL? When having a good ship to you, to your place of business, make sure that either the seller has responsibility for the goods or that you or the common carrier are adequately insured. Also, be aware that FOB is based in US law and international shipping has its own set of terms. Our second exception relates to consignments. What are consignments? When someone gives us inventory to sell on their behalf. We often hear of consignment stores which sell expensive used clothing. The store processes the sale and then passes along the proceeds, minus their cut, to the actual seller. Or because this is Maine, think of a multifamily yard sale that's held on a single driveway and all the items have little stickers on them that say which family is selling that particular item. Consignments happen in business to business as well, and my favorite example is that of the Legs Hosiery brand. An example. Yeah, pretty lame. Anyway, the idea behind it was to package the hose in this little plastic egg. You had kind of the bottom down here, and then a little egg on top. And it's amazing how many ways this worked. It's le eggs, because it's an egg. It's legs, because they go on your legs. And there's that little le in front, which makes it all French and fabulous and stuff. And they wanted to sell it in grocery stores. Now, the grocery store people said the then equivalent of, are you on crack? You want us to sell what? Because if you think about it, it really is a pretty ridiculous idea. 
But what Hanes did was say to the grocery stores, we will provide a display case. We will provide all the product. We will have our employees take care of restocking. And we are going to market the hell out of it on TV and via coupons. All you have to do is collect the money for us and pass along the proceeds minus your cut. And the rest is history. So here we have a situation in which the inventory is in the physical custody of the grocery store, but it would not be included in their inventory because they never actually owned it. All those little plastic eggs filled with hose belonged on Haynes's balance sheet, not Hannaford's. There are a couple of other things for us to be aware of. First of all, the idea of a buyback. Let's say I sell you inventory for a million bucks and I promise to buy it back from you in a year for 1.1 million. What have I done right here? Have I really sold you those goods? Nah. What that is, is a loan. You just loaned me $1 million at a 10% interest, and I gave you inventory as collateral. So here we have a transaction that looks like it ought to be a sale, and the contract might even say sale on it, but the accountants say, no, 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 and say no sale. Even though I might have given you the goods, they have left my possession, they never leave my books. Instead, the journal shows up as a debit to cash for $1 million and a credit to debt for $1 million. This seems like it's common sense, but we have this rule because people tried to game the system at some point in the past. It's not a sale, it's a loan. The second item relates to sales of inventory, for which we can expect significant returns. For us to report revenues and associated expenses, we have to have a pretty good idea of exactly how much of the stuff we sold we think will actually stay sold. And if we can't figure that out, we have to wait until the return window has closed before we book the sales. An example of this would be the magazine industry. If you go down to the local borders and look at the magazine rack, they've got all this crazy esoteric crap that you can't imagine anyone actually buying, but it's all there. Now the way the industry works is that the magazine companies have an expectation of roughly how many magazines they would expect to sell in any given month. And then they ship extras. Because the incremental cost to produce isn't that high, and you never know when we might have the next big scoop that sells out, so they want to be prepared just in case. Borders knows how many copies of Dave Monthly get sold too, but they play along with this overbuy because the magazine companies have promised them that any unsold issues can be returned for a full refund. So here we have a situation in which the magazine company has shipped 50 units when they expect to get 20 of them back. If this is the case, then the magazine company should only record the sales for 30 of the units. 50 were shipped, but they only get to recognize 30 until the end of the, the display period for that issue when they will then true things up. What if they have no idea, no way to estimate it at all? Then they should defer all the sales until the end of the display period, and only once they have the hard data do they get to record the sales. In the meanwhile, that inventory stays on their books. Our last one is installment sales. In some cases, for large purchases, the seller will finance the transaction with the buyer, agreeing to be paid over several years. John Deere tractors, for example, they know that Farmer Brown up in the county can't afford to drop a half million on a new tractor, but they still want to make the sale. So instead, they write up the contract in the form of a lease. Or they write it up as a sale, but they retain legal title to the tractor until the final payment is made so that repoing it is easy if Farmer Brown can't pay. In this case, the asset legally belongs to John Deere, but everyone can agree that the transaction really was a sale and their holding on to the title was just a way to protect themselves from loss. In this case, the transaction will indeed be recorded as a sale and the inventory will be taken off the books. Okay, so we know which items are ours and which items aren't. The next question is to ask what value we should put on them. If you recall our accounting framework, everything needs to be expressed in terms of U.S. dollars, so simply knowing if an item is ours or not isn't enough. Once again, there is a general rule, and that rule is all costs required to get the inventory ready for sale. Remember that little picture in the notes when we talked about matching, and we said there are costs that are going to be capitalized and deferred until we make the sale? Well, here they are. And what do we mean by costs? Well, obviously, there's the direct purchasing costs. If we're a retailer, it's inventory for resale. If we're a manufacturer, 
its raw material inventory. But that's not all. We're going to include our labor. So when we've got guys down on the machine floor, we're not debiting wage expense and crediting cash, we're debiting inventory and crediting cash. Why? Because the revenue associated with their labor happens when we make the sale. So we capitalize and defer until the sale happens. And that's still not all. Overhead. If we have a manufacturing plant that has bunches of machinery in it, we're supposed to depreciate that stuff, right? We depreciate our equipment. Well, what is that machinery doing? It's making the inventory that we're going to sell. So that depreciation is related to the products that are being shipped off to our customers and earning us revenue. So we won't be debiting depreciation expense, we'll essentially be debiting inventory. It's a little circuitous, and we'll get to that in Chapter 12, but that's what we're doing. Internal transfer costs. Let's say we're an automotive manufacturer and we have a foundry in Indianapolis that makes all of our engines, but the final assembly happens up in Detroit. The cost of putting all those engines on a train and chugging them on up to their final assembly location is a cost of inventory too. Anything that needs to be spent to get inventory in sellable condition is inventory. Once the inventory is ready for sale, however, capitalization stops and we start expensing things. The cost of shipping the engine to Detroit is inventory. The cost of delivering a car to the buyer is an expense. Costs associated with warehousing our raw materials is a part of inventory. Costs of warehousing our finished goods is an expense. Something to keep in mind relates to what we did last class with the sales discounts. If you remember, you guys managed to squeeze some discounts out of me for those donut holes, paying only $427.50 instead of the full $500. That was a sales discount for me, and it would have been a purchase discount for you. Although the original purchase price was 500 after you returned the inventory and got the extra discount for me, you paid quite a bit less. That 427.50 would be the cost of inventory on your books, not the undiscounted amount. So, we know which units belong to us, we know how to assign costs to them as we buy them, and as we improve them, or as we produce them. The next question asks, how often should we be updating all that information within our accounting system? Now, before we get into this, let me be clear that this is not a decision about whether or not we have any idea what's out in our warehouse. We should have an inventory control system that can tell us exactly how much of each product we've got, so if a customer calls us and asks if we got it, we can say yes or no. What we're talking about here is how often we'll update the dollar value of the inventory we have on our books, how often we update our T-account. As processing power has increased and the cost of storage has decreased, this has become less of an issue. But for many companies, it still doesn't make sense to keep real-time data on inventory dollar values. The two options are the perpetual method and the periodic method. You have the two options side by side on your paper, but I can't do that, so I've got them broken up into slides. We'll start with the perpetual method. What we'll be doing is updating our inventory in real time. Every time we go beep, beep, beep at the cash register, we're updating our inventory T account. This, as you can imagine, is time consuming and costly, even with increases in computer power. Imagine Walmart trying to do that. Every time they go beep, they would have to credit their inventory for the cost of that pack of gum and those roller skates and that incredibly tacky underwear. But let's say that we plan on updating our inventory in real time. Let's buy some inventory. Inventory is an asset, and assets go up with a debit. So we debit our inventory for $6,000. 500 units at 12 bucks each is six grand. We haven't paid for the inventory yet, so that means our liabilities have gone up as well. Credit accounts payable. We then sell 600 units at $20 per unit. We had beginning inventory of 1,000 units on hand for 12 bucks each, so selling 600 isn't a problem. We already know the sales half of the transaction from last class, debit accounts receivable for 12, and credit sales for 12. But now we need to adjust our inventory account as well. And that means crediting our inventory for 600 units times 12 bucks each for a total of $7,200. If you remember class 3's lecture, the name for inventory expense is cost of goods sold, and that will be our debit. Doing this gives us matching in real time, and we can immediately see that we've got a gross profit here of $4,800.
That's a benefit of using the perpetual method. We always have a pretty good idea of where we stand in the context of hitting our profit targets for the period. We then close our books at the end of the month and we take a physical inventory. Because we always take a physical inventory. Even if we keep our books on a perpetual basis, we'll always do a physical count of inventory. From the standpoint of an audit, it's required. No auditor worth their gray suit will take our word for what we say inventory is. From the standpoint of good business practices, it's essential. All sorts of things can be happening out there in the warehouse, from breakage to spoilage to theft. That if we, and if we don't have periodic counts, we're going to be in a world of trouble. So we go out and we take our physical inventory, and we find that we've got 900 units out there, which is exactly what we were expecting. This means that at the end of the period, we don't have to do anything with our accounting system, since the books are already reflecting reality. Ta-da! There's my little smiley face that means no journal entry needed. So there's the perpetual method. On the other side, we have the periodic method, which as you might guess, changes the inventory account only periodically. How periodically? Once, at the end of each reporting period, however long that may be. So what do we do? When we make this purchase, we're not going to change our inventory account. We're going to use a temporary account called Purchases and credit our accounts payable. That account will accumulate all the inventory purchases during the year. Then when we make the sale, we'll record the revenue side as always, but again, we will forego updating the inventory account in real time. We'll go back and forth with these two entries with every purchase and sale, respectively. So now comes the end of the year, and we go out to do that count, and we find the 900 units that cost us 12 bucks each sitting out there. What do we do? We need to update our accounting system, because it's currently telling us that we've got 1,000 units. And it's also telling us that we have this account called Purchases, which is a temporary account that needs to be closed. And we haven't recognized any costs of goods yet, so our income statement is all screwed up. So we've got a lot of work to do. Luckily, we can fix all of those items with a single journal entry. First of all, let's fix the balance sheet. It currently says $12,000, and it needs to say $10,800. So let's do that. We'll debit inventory for what we counted it to be, $10,800, and credit inventory for the $12,000 beginning balance. Our inventory T account now says exactly what it's supposed to, and that means our balance sheet will be happy. Next, we've got that purchase account sitting there, and we know that we need to close it out. It's got a debit balance from when we bought the inventory, so let's close it out with the credit. There's that second thing we needed to do. The last thing we need to do is recognize our cost of goods sold, and that will be the number that makes our journal entry balance. So our cost of goods sold will be a plug, and that's going to be $7,200. Since all of our inventory cost us the same amount, that's the same cost of goods that we had as under the perpetual method. Now why does this work? Well, let's look at the journal entry. This entry is the accounting version of a very simple equation. Beginning inventory plus purchases minus costs of goods sold equals ending inventory. That should be very intuitive. What did we start with? What did we buy? What did we sell? That gives us what we ended with. If we fill in what we know, we get 12,000 plus 6,000 minus x is equal to 10,800. We know 12,000 because that was from last year's count. We know 6,000 because we have the purchase invoices. We know 10,800 because we just went out and counted again. What's the only x that makes that equation balance? The 7,200. We've got two ways of coming to the same place. Both the perpetual and periodic methods will yield the same ending inventory. Why? By design, because we went out and counted it, and we know that's our number. Looking at the t accounts of these two uh, methods, we see the difference. Under the perpetual method, we've got our purchase over here, and we've got our sale over here, and we get our ending inventory down here. On the other side, we see the closeout of the beginning entry, and the establishment of ending inventory, and we're done. With only one transaction, they don't look particularly different.
But again, if you think about all those purchases we make during the year and all the beep, beep, beeps we do when we sell things, that perpetual T account is going to fill up with numbers pretty quick. The periodic method, however, will never get more complicated than that. What happens if on June 30th only 850 items are out there? The polite term for this is shrinkage. Under the perpetual method, we go out there and the T account looks like this. We started with our 12,000, we added the 6,000, we sold the 7,200, give us, giving us an ending balance of 10,800. And we know that's wrong because we just went out and counted and found only 850 at 12 or $10,200. So what do we do? We plug another 600 of credit into the inventory T account so that it books, our books are properly stated. What's on the other side? Well, inventory going poof is a boo-hoo sort of thing. That's a reduction in equity, so we debit a loss. This will get added to cost of goods sold for the sake of our financial statements. So let's do this instead under the periodic method. Our T account looks like this. Just a $12,000 beginning balance, right? And then we went out and counted the inventory and found that we had 850 units at 12 bucks each. And we said, huh, ending inventory must be $10,200. So let's do our journal entry. Debit inventory for the ending amount. Credit our in beginning inventory. Close out the purchases. And we plug the cost of goods sold. And now our cost of goods sold is equal to 7800 and the information about that 600 is lost. Don't underestimate the power of shrinkage. As I mentioned once before, I used to work at a Sam's Club and we had problems with cigarettes being stolen. So we put them in a cage with a lock and a camera. And still, somehow we lost 2,000 bucks of cigarettes a month. I'm no detective, but I think it was an inside job. Going out and doing these counts is what allows us to get a grasp on what's really going on in the warehouse. So now we come to one of my favorite parts of this class, because I get to draw some pictures. I'm a horrible artist, but when I'm teaching, I've got a captive audience, and I milk it for all it's worth. Our next question relates to inventory that we buy over time at different prices. Say we're a home heating oil company, and we buy oil for $2 a gallon at the beginning of the month, and we buy it for $2.25 at the end of the month. Here we've got a pool of inventory that's functionally the same, but different units have different costs associated with them. Which ones did we sell? Well, the answer to that question depends on your information needs. In some cases, we need to know exactly what items were sold. For instance, let's say we're a jewelry store. You married guys know what I'm talking about. You unmarried guys, I pity you for what you need to go through. You go to a jewelry store to buy a diamond ring, and they lay out all the diamonds in front of you, and each one is different, and each one sparkles like your lovely wife, or something. But they all have different colors and different clarities and different cuts and blah, blah, blah. But all those together make a huge impact on what the diamond store paid for the gem and what you in turn will have to pay for them. No two diamonds are identical. You'll even get a certificate with pictures and measurements and such so they keep track of which one they sold for how much. It's funny, I was working for Anderson when I was shopping for my wife's ring, and one of my colleagues warned me, don't give her a ring on a holiday. If you do, it's a gift, and she doesn't have to give it back if things don't work out. The hell? That was advice I really wanted to hear. Like, you'd want it back anyways. Sell it on eBay, I guess. Engagement ring, used once. There's a big bundle of depression. So for that sort of business, we're going to use the specific identification method. Each individual unit of inventory will be tracked start to finish, and as we sell one, its specific cost will be debited to cost of goods sold. Clearly, we'll be using a perpetual inventory method for this. In addition to jewelry stores, art galleries are likely to use specific identification as well. Most classes also suggest auto dealers as a business that would use specific ID, but that was not generally true. We'll get into that in a little bit. So there's our first option. For the next three options, I need to stress something that is very important. These three are all assumptions about the flow of inventory. They are not meant to represent the physical flow of goods. The way we store and deliver goods to our customers will be dictated by industry best practices. 
but the way that we account for their costs are a completely separate decision that has nothing to do with reality. What item we say went out the door for accounting purposes is an assumption and an assumption only. Make sure you are clear on that point. Our first possibility is FIFO, which stands for first in, first out. Now you'll notice that FIFO has got two F's to it, and this is going to help me draw my picture. Here is the warehouse in which we store our goods, and the warehouse has got two doors to it. Why? Because there are two F's in FIFO. Humor me. So over on this side of the warehouse, the delivery truck pulls up here from our supplier. It's got his little tires and such, and boom, boom. And we've got the cab with our guy working in there. And there's our little guy driving it. Okay. And they want to unload a box of stuff. So out comes the box from the supplier. When that inventory is offloaded from the truck, it gets put on a conveyor belt that whisks it across this unreasonably tall warehouse. Vroom. I'll put one more over here. Where it meets another truck, this one, headed off to our customers. See, I told you I can't draw very well. So now, if we were to number these boxes of inventory in the order in which they were brought to us by our supplier, this guy over here would be the first one, the second one, and the third one, and so on. If we were to number these boxes in the order in which we sent them to our customer, the order would be the same. This guy, then this guy, then this guy. So when we say that we sold 600 units of inventory, which ones did we sell first? This guy. This guy this guy. And when we say that we've got 900 units of inventory still in the warehouse, which ones are left? We assume it's this guy, and this guy, and this guy, and this guy. The first ones from the supplier are the first ones sold, and the last ones from su the supplier are the ones we still have in stock. And that's product rotation. That's the way most businesses want their physical flow to go, right? That way we minimize spoilage. Another summer job I had was the dairy guy at the grocery store. I've had a bunch of shit jobs. And I was the only one to rotate the cheese. So I'd come home from Christmas vacation, and I'd go digging in the cheese bin, and I'd pull out all this hairy stuff, some of which spoke with a Brooklyn accent. Hey, buddy! Anywhere. Anyway, there's FIFO. First items off the truck are the first ones going to our customer. Our next choice is LIFO which stands for last in, first out. The last items off the truck are the first items that go to our customers. This is anti-rotation. And what do we know by looking at the term LIFO? We know that the warehouse I draw is only going to have one door, of course. So, here's our warehouse with its one door on it, and here's our truck. Okay and our worker, and they come to unload some stuff. Now, when they unload that truck, where are they going to put the boxes? Clearly not over here, because then the next time someone walks in, they trip and fall and file a worker's comp claim against us. So we definitely don't want to do that. Where are they going to put it? They're going to put it over here in this back corner. That'd be box number one, box number two, box number three, four, five, and six. So now, it comes time for us to sell the stuff, and the question is, which stuff is it we're going to sell? Well, here's our worker, Bob. And Bob is unionized, which means he's lazy, so he doesn't want to work so hard. We can't fire him, because he's tenured. Crap! So we tell Bob to go load up some boxes to be taken to the customer. So he hikes up his belt and saunters on over to our inventory, and which ones is he going to load up? The ones closest to the door, of course. He doesn't want to have to lift too much. So we take these guys. One, two, and three. What is the inventory that goes out the door? The newest stuff. What is the inventory still in the warehouse? The oldest stuff. And that's how we're going to assume inventory is flowing. Is that the way we can really run our business? 
Of course not. In most cases, that's a terrible model for inventory flow. It works in gravel or coal. There's a big pile of that stuff, and the coal in the bottom doesn't spoil, so we can just leave it there. No big deal. In most cases, though, having LIFO be our physical flow is a wretched idea. In fact, back when I first started teaching this stuff, I thought about what sort of business could use LIFO and still be okay. And I immediately thought about Twinkies. Because if you think about it, that stuff lasts forever. You could stock your bomb shelter with it and then enjoy your golden cakey goodness and safety while the radiation zombies run amok overhead. And to prove the point, I went to Sam's and bought a case of them and thought, aha, for the next 24 years, I'll be able to walk into class, open one of those things up and say, LIFO! and eat it. And the first year I did, I got so violently ill. Holy cow. So not even Twinkies work for LIFO. So our last option is average cost. And with average cost, we know that we bought a bunch of stuff, and that stuff costs us a bunch of money. But beyond that, we have no idea what any individual item's cost happens to be. And we don't care. We don't have a warehouse for this, since we don't have any Fs. Instead, we have a big, ugly oil bin down on the Penobscot River by Hollywood Slots. Oh my goodness. That is a very ugly bin. So what do we do? We buy a can of oil uh, from over at Exxon, and we put a little spout in it, and we pour it into the top. Bloop, 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 bloop. And we do that again and again, and we do that like a gazillion times give or take a little bit. And then what happens? Well, I'm not an engineer, and hopefully neither are you. So I'll just declare THERMODYNAMICS! And stuff swirls around there with little swishy lines. Hot stuff rises, cold stuff sinks, the quarts of oil that we bought have all been mixed around. So now, when we come down here to our spigot on the bottom, and we want to fill an oil can that we're going to sell to our customer, what quart are we selling? We don't know, and we don't care. What we know is that we bought a gazillion quarts of oil, and in total, that gazillion quarts cost us a great big bunch of money, and so the cost that we will assign this particular quart of oil is going to be an average. And those are our three assumptions. None of them have to have any basis in reality whatsoever. We can cost our Twinkies or our cheese under LIFO. We can cost our gravel pits under FIFO. We can do any of them using the average cost method. Our cost flow assumption is simply a time-saving method that allows us to calculate costs. So let's do some math and see what effect this stuff has on our financial statements, because we'll see that this can have significant effects indeed. We're going to make a couple of purchases for 20, for 20, and 80. We're going to make a couple of sales, and then we're going to see where we find ourselves on the back end of all of this. Let's start with FIFO. We bought 20 units at 1. We bought 10 units at 2. And then we sold 25 units for 5. That's all a statement of fact. Our inventory flow choice doesn't change reality. It simply changes the way we record that reality. We wrote a check for 20. We wrote a check for 20. We received a check for 125. The question is that if we sold 25 units, which 25 went out the door? Under the FIFO inventory assumption, the first in are the first out, which means that we will start with the oldest in inventory. Those were the first ones on the conveyor belt, and therefore the first ones sent to our customers. So, we sold all 20 of these guys. That's not enough, though, because we sold 25, so we also sold 5 of the $2 ones. So our cost of goods sold is equal to $30. What's left in inventory? We still have those five left at two, so we've got ten bucks here in inventory. Then let's buy and sell some more stuff. We bought twenty, and then we sold ten. Which ten? Well, we sold the ones furthest along the conveyor belt, or these remaining five guys up here at ten. We then sold the only stuff we had left, the ones at four, and now we have cost of goods sold of another thirty dollars. What's left in ending inventory? The remaining ones at $4 each. 15 at 4 is $60, and that's going to be our ending inventory. And that's what we put on our balance sheet. So now, what did we do? We bought $120 worth of stuff. 
Okay, this is Dave Co. We bought $120 billion of stuff. That is a statement of fact. Some of it we sold, and some of it we didn't. The choice of inventory flow simply lets us figure out how much of that went into cost of goods sold and how much we have left on hand. So let's see where we went. We had $30 of cost of goods sold here. We've got $30 of cost of goods sold here. So our total cost of goods sold is $60 billion. We have 60 left in our warehouse. And so between these two, we have successfully explained all 120's worth of inventory. Let's turn to LIFO. Once again, we bought 20 at 1 and 10 at 2 and sold 25 at 5. That hasn't changed. What's changed is our assumption about what went out the door. Now we assume the newest stuff has been sold first, not the oldest. So which did we sell? We sold the 10 at 2 and then we sold 15 at 1. We've now got $35 of cost of goods sold. And the five $1 ones that we have sitting back in the corner, we still have in inventory. We then purchase another 20 units. And we only have one door in the warehouse, so what do we do with those 20? We stack them on top of the $1 ones, of course. So when we sold these 10 units for five, which ones did we sell? The ones closest to the door, the $4 ones. So all 10 of those units will be costed at $4 for total cost of goods sold of $40. What does this leave us in ending inventory? Those five that were back there in the corner and the remaining four at $10 each. That totals $45 of ending inventory to go on our balance sheet. Once again, we've got $120 of inventory to explain and where did it go? 75 went to cost of goods sold, 45 went to ending inventory, and there's our $120 of stuff. Good. Our last one is average cost. We bought 20 for 1, we bought 10 for 2, we sold 25 at 5. Which 25? I don't know. Say it with me. I don't know. It's fun, and it'll make the other people in the room wonder why you're talking to your computer. I don't know. We don't know. But what do we know? We know that we had a total of 30 bucks of inventory and it cost us a total of 40 bucks. So if I told you to go in and grab a box of inventory and then asked you how much it cost, what would you say? Go on, say it. I don't know. But you could say that each box on average costs us about a buck 33. So if we sold 25 boxes and each cost an average of a buck 33, then the cost of that stuff we sold must have been $33. And there is going to be our cost of goods of goods sold. What's left in inventory? Hey, what do we still got back there? Five units. How much do they cost us? I don't know. But the five cost us an average of $1.33. So we'll say that we've got $7 of inventory still out there. So now we get a new purchase. We bought 20 units at 4 for a total of 80, and we sell 10 for 5. Which 10? I still don't know. We have to come up with a new average. Now how many units do we have out in the warehouse before this sale? 25. The 20 that we purchased plus the 5 that were sitting out there. And how much should we pay for those units in total? 87 bucks. So we can now calculate a new average. Note that the old inventory has lost its individual identity. We no longer have $1 and $2 boxes. We only have $1.33 boxes. And they get blended in with our new average. Which 10 did we sell? I don't know. But those 10 cost us an average of $3.48 each. So we have cost of goods sold of about $35. What do we still have in inventory? The other 15 units, and those each cost us also $3.48, and that comes out to 52 bucks in ending inventory on the balance sheet. Let's double check. We've got a total of this plus this gives us a total of 68 of cost of goods sold for the period. We've got $52 of ending inventory, and what does that add up to? 
120 billion dollars or something I don't know how many zeros there are good here we have the same fact pattern of buying and selling but we have three different outcomes depending on which assumption we use to cost the inventory of course we did all these out of the perpetual method if we'd done them under the periodic method we would have gotten a different set of results the FIFO wouldn't change, but let's say we used the periodic method for LIFO. We sold, sold a total of 35 units, and with the benefit of hindsight, which 35 did we sell? All 20 of these, all 10 of these, and then 5 of these guys at 1. That does have the potential to save us quite a bit of work. So here we have our ending inventory of 15, and what did it cost us? Well, it depends. In your notes are three sets of income statements to look at, with some other information fleshed in. In all cases, we've got sales of $175. Our customers don't care what the inventory method was that we used, so long as they aren't getting that moldy cheese. Our selling expenses are fixed, because our landlord doesn't care about our costing assumption. Our commissions are going to be based on sales prices, not based on cost of goods sold. What's not fixed? Cost of goods sold, of course, and gross profit, which is sales minus cost of goods sold. But also our tax expense down here, because our tax expense is based on pre-tax net income, and our pre-tax net income is based upon our gross profit, which is, of course, based upon our cost of goods sold. During periods of rising prices, such as this example, 1, then 2, then 4, FIFO will always yield a higher net income and higher ending inventory, and LIFO will always yield a lower net income and a lower ending inventory. In periods of deflation, we have the opposite effect. An average will always come out somewhere in between. On the bottom, we once again see that in all three cases, we've got total purchases of $120, all that we're doing is apportioning them between costs of good and ending inventory. Now let's look at this in a cash in, cash out basis on the next page. Here we aren't making assumptions about what we sold or didn't sell. Everything is given. We bought $120 of inventory. We earned $175 in sales. We paid SG&A expenses of 30. And let's just go ahead and throw in an opening cash balance of 100. All of that is fixed and has nothing to do with our inventory flow choice, except that pes pesky tax payment down here. And what do we see? Lower cash here, and higher cash here. Look familiar? This is what we did that very first day when I asked you to choose between A Corp and B Corp. Here's A Corp, and here's B Corp and they both did exactly the same thing all year long. But one reported higher net income due to an accounting choice that resulted in higher tax payments. The other reported lower net income and thus made lower tax payments. I'm not a tax person. I typically beg my students not to ask me tax questions because I won't know the answers. I typically screw up at least one thing on my tax return every year and need to get a bill. With that caveat, I believe that inventory flow is the only place where our financial accounting choice and our tax accounting choice have to jive. If we choose to use LIFO and get this tax benefit right here, we're required by law to use LIFO for book purposes and accept the lower income. If we were to use FIFO for book purposes and recognize higher profits, we are forbidden from saving taxes by using LIFO. As it happens, those auto dealers tend to use LIFO for this very reason. The tax savings can be substantial, and if you're a car dealer, do you care what net income is? Probably not, since net income is just an accounting number. If you own a car dealership, or any other business, what you care about is how much cash you can pull out of the company to buy food and pay your mortgage and whatnot. And their volume isn't so great that the record keeping becomes terrible, so they're the perfect candidate for LIFO. What does this mean? If you go to a car dealership and you see that nice new shiny 2011 model year car out on the lot for 30 grand, in the accounting system it might be a 1950 car that only costs the dealer 250 bucks. 
So now that we see this, we should no longer be fooled. We know that footnote 1 gives us the summary of reporting procedures used by the firm, and we can see what firms are using FIFO and having artificially inflated net incomes compared to LIFO firms. Using FIFO isn't going to fool anyone. With that in mind, you might ask why anyone still uses FIFO. The benefit is in higher reported net income, and that's completely transparent to all, so all we're doing is throwing money away. And in fact, studies have shown that the market values a dollar of LIFO earnings more than the dollar of FIFO earnings when setting stock price. There are two potential answers to this. The first lies in that cost-benefit relationship we talked about in the second class. There is a clear tax benefit to be gained by using LIFO, but maintaining LIFO can be very costly and time-consuming. Not every firm is going to find the tax benefits outweigh the costs of implementation and perpetual record keeping. The second is a more philosophical perspective. Recall our two methods of calculating bad debt expense, one focused on getting the income statement right, and one focused on getting the balance sheet right, and we said we couldn't do both. Well, the same thing is true here as well. If we use LIFO, we are matching our most recent inventory with our current sales. If we were to buy more inventory, we would be more likely to pay four than one. So the LIFO income statement comes closer to predicting the buying and selling activities of the firm in the near future. Unfortunately, the balance sheet isn't so good because it still has that box we bought back in 1950 sitting in the corner with the cobwebs all over it. This isn't a problem with FIFO, however, because if you recall, FIFO is going to have the most recent inventory still in the warehouse. The stuff that we put on the balance sheet is an accurate picture of what inventory costs today in real time it's essentially telling us replacement cost. If we had to go out and buy that inventory again, what would we need to, sp to spend on it? The downside, though, is that we're matching stale costs with recent prices, and so our income statement can get a little bit out of whack. Once again, we can't make both the balance sheet and the income statement correct, so we have to pick one or the other. Now, there's one more thing to keep in mind about LIFO. What units did we have in stock after we made that sale of 10 for 5? We had 10 at 4, and we had 5 at 1, right? So those $1 units are still on the books. How long will they remain on the books? As long as we have even a single one of those $4 units left, all five $1 units will stay on the books. And how do we manage to do that? Well, we continue to buy at least as much as we sell. The only way we can get rid of those $1 ones is if we sell our inventory down to fewer than 5 units. But what if we don't? What then? Well, we call that a LIFO liquidation, and this is important for us to understand for a couple of reasons. First of all, let's go back to our friend the auto dealer. He just had a LIFO liquidation, which means that the truck he sold you today was that $250 one from 1950 on the books. What does that mean for his business? he'll be matching the current $30,000 price tag with the 1950 cost, and what does that mean? It means that the current period gross profit is going to go through the roof, which is going to flow into net income, and that means we're going to get walloped with taxes this year. So if we're not careful, we could find ourselves in a sticky situation with our tax bill. The second thing is related to the first. When we have a LIFO liquidation, we get that wonderful little net income pop. And while the typical small business owner doesn't give a fig about net income, the non-owner managers might. And as the size of the business increases, the likelihood of non-owner management increases. So let's say that I'm a division manager, and I'm looking at my profit forecasts, and I don't think I'm going to make my bonus. What do I do? I defer a purchase near the end of the year, having it shipped on January 1st instead of December 31st. Sure, the company takes the cash flow hit, but my reported net income looks good. So LIFO provides significant tax advantages, but has a couple of problems associated with it, about which we need to be aware. For what it's worth, there's quite a bit of additional complexity that we can layer onto LIFO if we'd like to, but that's well beyond the scope of this class. Also, a company does not need to track all of its inventory in one method. I've seen footnotes in which a company has said, we primarily use X method, but also Y and Z. John Deere might be a good example of this. They may find the benefits from using LIFO worth the cost of implementing on their tractors and other heavy equipment. Those are large, large dollar value, low volume products. 
Even if they do, however, it's unlikely that they would find it worth using LIFO for their line of toys, which are considerably less expensive. One more major topic about inventory before we wrap up with our financial analysis. Lower of cost or market. So, what is our general rule? Our general rule is pretty much just common sense. When we report our inventory on the balance sheet, we shouldn't say that it's worth more than it really is, because if we do that, we go to jail and that's no fun. This doesn't mean we write inventory up to fair value. We recognize the gain on our inventory only when we sell it. But if we know that inventory is worth less than we paid for it, conservatism tells us that we should take the full amount of the loss today without waiting for the actual sale to happen. The computer industry is a perfect example of this. Technology improves at such a rapid rate that obsolescence is a constant problem. Someone, somewhere, probably has a warehouse full of old computers and they're scratching their heads and wondering, what the hell am I going to do with all this stuff? Five years ago, this stuff was cutting edge and I paid 500 bucks a unit for it. But if they went to a computer show somewhere and tried to sell them as more than particularly large paperweights, they'd get laughed out the door. We've got to write that stuff down. So, what do we consider to be market value? Well, the easy answer to this is replacement cost. How much would it cost us to replace all that inventory from scratch, either by buying it if we're a reseller, or making it from scratch if we're a manufacturer? The actual calculations are a bit more complicated than that, but that's good enough for now. So here we have the inventory listing for Dave's Donut Holes and Fritters 2. They've recently expanded into the ever-so-lucrative fritter market because they're just so darn tasty. If you feel the urge to go get yourself some munchkins or apple fritters, again, feel free to stop the recording and get some. I can wait! So we've got three types of donut holes. The raspberry, the apple, and those nasty coconut ones. And the apple fritters. At the end of the year, we need to do some analysis. We should be doing it at least once a year, though if we receive information that our inventory has lost value, we should do it mid-year as well. We have the units on hand, how much we paid for them, and how much it would cost for us to get new ones. The numbers are a little silly for donut holes, but humor me. We have a choice as to how we're going to go about doing this. We can look at product, the product individually, we can place our inventory into groups, or we can do this for our inventory as a whole. Let's run some numbers and see how this all works out. On an item by item basis, let's start with our raspberry donut holes. Things co these things cost us $300 and have a replacement cost of $360, which means that the lower of the two is the cost, so that will be our lower of cost or market. Reporting our donut holes at a value of $300 is not misleading. Good. We then turn to the apple donut holes. The cost is 160, but replacement is only 140, so we will use that for our lower of cost or market. Crap! Looks like our donut holes have lost some value. I told you raspberry was better. So we need to write down our inventory by the difference, or $20. We're sad. Sad face. Okay. Our coconut donut holes took a beating, with a cost of 60 and a replacement of 10. Lower of cost to market is 10, so we're looking at a $50 loss. We're not just sad, we're despondent. How many emo kids does it take to change a light bulb? None. Let them cry in the dark. And then, our fritters are fine, with a total cost of 225 a total market of 240 and so we're good. So when we do all the math, we see that we have a total cost of being $745. We see a total lower of cost or market being 300 plus 140 plus 10 plus 225 is equal to 675, and we have to report a $70 loss. So we'll have a $70 loss on an item by item basis. Let's say we wanted to do this on a group basis instead. Well, what we could do would be, we would pool all of our donut holes into a single group and do our analysis that way. The total cost of our donut holes is $520. And the total replacement cost of our donut holes is $510. So lower of cost our market is $510, and since our fritters are still good, we're looking at a $10 loss. Or we can simply compare the inventory in the aggregate, 
and we can say that we've got total inventory that cost us $745 with a total replacement cost of $750 and for the whole inventory method we've got no loss at all, at all and we can draw ourselves a happy face. So as we create groupings, increases in values of some inventory can offset losses on other inventory, pushing the required loss downward. Item by item is the most conservative, and whole inventory is the least conservative. It's our choice in what we do. We have to be consistent from period to period, but otherwise it's our choice. So how do we book this loss? Well, we're going to credit inventory to decrease its value to whatever we had calculated, 675 or 735 or whatever, and we're going to plug it into cost of goods sold. So we'll debit cost of goods sold for either 70 or for 10, and we will credit our inventory for either 70 or for 10. Once again, this introduces an interesting thing that we can play around with if we are so inclined. Let's say that the following year, Dave's Donut Holes and Fritters 2 were to sell those nasty coconut donut holes for 70 bucks. What would we recognize as gross profit over these two periods? Well, under the lower of cost or market, in year one, we've got a loss of 50 due to that write down from 60 to 10. In year two, however, when we sell this stuff, we'll report a gross profit of 60 since we're going to be comparing our selling price of 70 to our now written down cost of 10. Over the two year window, we end up with a net profit of 10, and that should make sense because we bought it for 60 and we sold it for 70. That's how far ahead we are. If we don't use lower of cost to market, what happens? Well, in year one, we don't do anything. We just leave it on the books at 60. In year two, we sell it for 70, recognizing our gross profit of 10. Once again, over this two year window, we've got our $10 profit on the sale of this inventory. Over the life of this inventory, it is what it is. What we bought it for and what we sold it for are both fixed. This lower of cost or market rule again provides the opportunity for some shenanigans. Let's say we're having a bad year and there's no way we're going to hit our bonus. What do we do? We write down some of this stuff and push net income even further down. Then, next year, we'll get this huge gross profit that might make it so that we hit our earnings target and ka-ching, ka-ching, we've just made our bonus. So the lower of cost or market system has allowed us to move income from one period to the next, and we're able to do it under the guise of being conservative. Pretty cool, huh? Now the same reason why this works makes inventory a very attractive place for people to commit fraud. It works because of how the inventory account rolls from year to year and how inventory ends up on the income statement. It works because each year we do a full physical count of inventory and an error will self-correct itself over time. That is, even if we totally blow it in one year, when we count our inventory next year, everything will be trued up and we can go on our merry way. Let's come back to our equation, beginning inventory plus purchases minus cost of goods sold equals ending inventory. Now what did we just do with our lower of cost or market shenanigans? We fudged ending inventory over here in our equation, right? We pushed ending inventory down, which means that cost of goods sold had to get pushed up since both ending inventory and purchases are static. We saw that back when we lost that inventory under the per uh, periodic method. We just end up plugging the cost of goods. So net income is too low, but now let's look at next year. This year's ending inventory becomes next year's beginning inventory. We've got beginning inventory plus purchases minus cost of goods sold equals ending inventory, and this guy goes right down here. Now if our ending inventory last year was too low, that means that our beginning inventory this year is also going to be too low. For the sake of simpler math, let's assume that when we go out and we count our inventory this year, we find out that it's correct. So what does this do to our equation? Our beginning inventory is too low. Our purchases are right. Our ending inventory is right. The only way that we can get this equation to work would be to push down cost of goods sold there. 
And we are pushing cost of goods sold down exactly the same amount that we pushed cost of goods sold up in the prior year. It's that same error showing up in the opposite direction this year. Over the two-year period, the error comes out in the wash. We saw that up here with that $50 difference on the coconut donut holes. We know that over the two years, we have to have the correct profit, 70 minus 60. But the timing is anything but right. So let's look ahead to year three. What effect does our mess up in year one have on year three's financial statements? None, because the error reversed itself in year two, and all traces of the error in our accounting system have been eliminated. This makes inventory a very good place for people to commit fraud, because they only have to get away with it once, and after that, they won't have to keep up pretenses. We could have double counted some of our inventory, making our ending inventory too high instead of too low, and the effect would have been reversed. It doesn't have to be our inventory account. It could be a purchase invoice that we don't record until the following period. This year's purchases will be too low, and next year's purchases will be too high. But over the two-year window, total purchases will be right. So again, the error will reverse. Let me take this moment to remind you that I do not condone financial statement fraud, but part of your education involves understanding that our accounting system provides opportunities to manipulate the financial statements for those who are interested in doing so. What I just showed you is absolutely trivial to do by someone with even just a passing understanding of accounting. Let's say for a moment that someone did this. Where do you think we might be able to see this happening? Well, let's analyze what's going on. Where do we see the effect of the stuff in the financial statements? It's here, in costs of goods sold, right? So we're fudging costs of goods, and that's the only place we're fudging on the income statement. Well, one of the things we might look at is gross profit percentage, the relationship between gross profit and sales. If we're fiddling around with cost of goods, that means that the relationship is going to be funky over a couple year window. Let's say the gross margin in one year is 20%, and in the next, it's only 10. What the hell happened? I can see all their competitors, and it doesn't seem like this was an industry-wide change, so what happened? Well, maybe that's a question you should ask of the people who are reporting to you. Maybe it's an error, maybe it isn't, but very simple ratio analysis might find that. Now, on the back of your notes, we have the little bit of financial analysis. Let's take a look at them. First, check those footnotes. Make sure you understand what accounting methods they're using, including inventory flow assumption. I think I've made that point clear enough. Second, as a business grows, there are some predictable relationships we can expect to see. As we increase our sales, it makes sense that we're going to start to carry more inventory, so we would expect those two to grow in tandem. Trend analysis is very helpful for this sort of thing. But what if these are out of whack? If so, it can signal problems, such as the Polaroid example in the book. Inventory increasing is fine, so long as sales are increasing. But if sales are decreasing at the same time that inventory is, is building up, then that's not a growth thing. That's a business being saddled with a bunch of crap that they can't unload kind of thing. Think about these sorts of relationships when you're looking at financial statements. Analysis isn't a quick process. Don't just run your eyes over it and say, uh-huh. Just like our receivables, we can calculate a turnover rate and the average age of our inventory. If we're in an inventory with significant spoilage or obsolescence issues, having inventory lying around for long periods of time can be deadly. Further, inventory represents money that we've got tied up in the business, money that could be spent paying bills or investing in expansion. The quicker we can get that inventory turned into cash, the happier we'll be. Third, if we're in a high margin business, like those diamond rings, inventory churn isn't necessarily so important. But if we're the dollar store, we have to make our profit on high volume. Even the slightest drop in our ability to get inventory sold quickly and reinvested could mean disaster for our business. Lastly, analysis of one firmer industry and analysis of another firmer industry often require different tools. For instance, in an industry that has a very quick turnover, inventory can play a more important role in our solvency analysis. Likewise, an industry with very slow turnover should focus on the quick ratio much more than the current ratio, since we may have to pay bills well before we're able to get that inventory sold.